Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And welcome to episode 272 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Ben Franklin's World is back. Now, over the last few months, the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team and I have been devising some really great new formats for the show, and we can't wait to share them with you. Now, Because some of the new formats we've devised are a bit more production heavy, like the sample you're going to hear today, the team and I will be shifting to an every other week release schedule. So rather than having a new episode every Tuesday, you should expect to have a new episode every other Tuesday. And I say should here because due to the global pandemic that is facing all of us right now, we might miss some release dates. Now, we're doing our best to stay on schedule, but like you, we just don't know what lies ahead of us in the weeks to come. We also need to postpone the introduction of some of the new formats we've developed. Like so many, we're working from home right now, and some of the new formats we've devised really need to be produced in the office. So much of what you'll hear on this podcast until we can get back into the office will be our historian interview format. As we can, we will introduce some examples of the new formats we intend to add to the show. So when you hear these new examples, please be sure to reach out and tell us what you think of them. You can also continue to rely on the fact that the Omohundro Institute and I are deeply committed to producing Ben Franklin's world and to making sure that each episode continues to offer you well-researched information about the early American past. Okay, let's talk about today's episode. I am really excited to share with you a sample of one of the new formats the team and I have been working on. Now, over the break, I took a class on how to produce audio narratives. Audio narratives are those episodes that we often hear on NPR and on podcasts like Serial. They're the format where you interview someone and then you add in a bit of narration to tell a story. So for the class I took, I had to produce a five minute story. So I reached out to a friend who's not only a great historian, but also a fantastic storyteller, Caitlin Galante DeAngelis Hopkins. Caitlin helped me out with my class by telling me a wonderful story about how two enslaved people helped bring freedom to Massachusetts. And if you can believe it, Caitlin and I recorded for nearly two and a half hours. Now, unfortunately, that was way too much of a story to try and break down into a five-minute piece. So I ended up creating a story out of something else that Caitlin mentioned during our conversation. As Caitlin regaled me with the story of Anthony Vassal and his wife, Cuba, she also told the story of the origins of the 11th Amendment to the United States Constitution. It turns out that that was a really fun aside and the perfect story to make a five-minute audio narrative out of. So without further ado, here is the story of the 11th Amendment and a short sample of one of the new formats we plan to add to Ben Franklin's world. know about the 11th Amendment. Amendment 11. The judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. It turns out that the language of the 11th Amendment revises Article 3, Section 2 of the United States Constitution. It prohibits American citizens from using the federal courts to sue states they don't reside in, and it prevents foreign citizens from using the federal courts to sue any state. But why was such an amendment necessary? The vassals were always involved in lawsuits. I could tell you several stories about sort of their legal shenanigans. That's Dr. Caitlin Galante DeAngelis Hopkins. She's a lecturer in the history department at Harvard University and a former research associate for the Harvard and Slavery Project. She's found that one of the vassals, William Vassal, is a big reason why we have the 11th Amendment. So William Vassal learned to sue people as a very young man. When he was at Harvard, he passed his tutor on the streets of Cambridge one day and didn't doff his hat to the tutor, which you were expected to do as a sign of respect. And so the tutor slapped him 
And his father, Leonard Vassell, sued the tutor for an incredible amount of money. And it went through the courts. And eventually the court told the tutor to just pay a five shilling fine, make this go away. And Harvard actually appealed that and said, no, it's the right of tutors to discipline students with physical punishment. And so that was William Vassell's sort of first lawsuit that he was involved in when he was a student at Harvard. But over the next several decades, he sued all of his neighbors and many public officials and just had a whole string of lawsuits. So William Vassell loved to challenge institutions and sue people. But what did Vassell's love for litigation have to do with the creation of the 11th Amendment? To understand that story, we need to fast forward a bit to the American Revolution and to William Vassell's claim that he was not a loyalist. He had not materially helped the British Army and he had not left, he said, because he agreed with the British Army. He had only left because... He said all of his money came from his plantation in Jamaica. He didn't have a business in Massachusetts and he couldn't afford to be cut off from Jamaica. But just because William Vassell didn't see himself as a loyalist didn't mean that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts saw him as a neutral. The Commonwealth had declared him a loyalist and a traitor and seized his property. He tried to get it back and tried to sue the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. William Vassell sued Massachusetts using the language in Article 3, Section 2 of the United States Constitution. This language implied that Vassell could sue a state in the United States Supreme Court, which was a very scary proposition to Massachusetts and to other states. Because if William Vassell was successful in his suit, then the federal government would have a chance to review the state's Loyalist Confiscation Acts, acts that permitted the states to confiscate and sell Loyalist property to raise funds to pay their war debts. This situation would not do. So Massachusetts Governor John Hancock called upon the state Senate and legislature to find a way to stop William Vassell. When John Hancock was very ill and was dying and was wheeled out onto the balcony to give an address to the legislature of Massachusetts as one of his very last acts, he was too weak actually to read the address. His secretary read it and he said, we really need to ask the Congress of the United States for a new amendment to the Constitution to stop William Vassell from suing us. There were other people who were trying to sue other states as well, but Massachusetts was one of the states that proposed the 11th Amendment, in part because William Vassell was so relentless in trying to sue them and get his property back. So who won this showdown between the states and exiled individuals like William Vassell? Did Vassell win his claim? No. The 11th Amendment says that a foreign citizen can't sue a state. And when we think about sort of the 11th Amendment and William Vassell, that's an amendment that says who is allowed to make a claim. And it says William Vassell is no longer allowed to make a claim, right? That's shutting him out. He's trying to use the courts to get his property back. And Massachusetts goes to fairly extreme measures to say, you need to stop talking to us. We don't have to listen to you. In the end, the reason why the 11th Amendment to the United States Constitution exists is because all of the states feared lawsuits like the one William Vassell pursued against Massachusetts. And so real was the state's fear that two-thirds of both houses of the United States Congress and three-quarters of the state legislatures approved and ratified the 11th Amendment in just under two years, making it part of the United States Constitution by February 7, 1795. So what did you think? I'd love to know what you thought of the origins of the 11th Amendment in this new audio narrative format. So please, send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Now, we'll meet with Caitlin again in the future because, as I mentioned, she told me the story of the 11th Amendment as an aside in a much larger story about how two enslaved people helped bring freedom to Massachusetts. So I'll be working on producing that story as the team and I also prepare some really great interview episodes for you and a new format we call Ask a Historian. Now, just as a reminder, Ben Franklin's World will be releasing every other Tuesday going forward. So our next episode will be available on Tuesday, May 5th. Lastly, one thing you've been asking me for for a really long time now is a virtual reading group. Well, I'm pleased to say that my teammate Holly White and I have started such a group in the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook. Now, like the new episode formats we've been developing for you, the reading group is a fun experiment. And it's an experiment we'd love to have you participate in. To join the Ben Franklin's World listener community, 
in our new virtual reading group, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Facebook. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash Facebook. And Holly and I are really looking forward to seeing you in there. Okay, you can find more information about Caitlin, the 11th Amendment, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. benfranklinsworld.com slash 272. If you enjoyed today's episode, I'd be grateful if you would please tell your friends and family about it. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Kayla Pittman, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, thank you for listening, and my teammates and I wish you and your family good health. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.